Thank you very much for uh, for spending spending this time with us. So, hi everybody. I'm Lauren Yi. I'm one of Signature Theater's resident playwrights, and uh, in case you couldn't tell, I'm very honored to be chatting with one of the busiest human beings uh, out there, Chaya Chow. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna read your bio, and then we can chat. Yeah. So, Chaya is the co-founder and executive director of Mekong NYC. It's a community-based organization in the Bronx that empowers the Cambodian and Vietnamese community through arts, culture, organizing, and advocacy. And as a feminist, she also co-founded the Southeast Asian Freedom Network to cultivate Southeast Asian social justice organizations nationwide. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I know this is, uh, it's always a busy week for you, but I think probably in particular, this is yeah. a particularly busy week for you. So thank you for making time. Of course, I'm probably not as busy and as tired as our Black organizers who's on the street. So mm -hmm. absolutely. So, uh, so maybe if we can start, uh, maybe your organization, Mekong NYC is located in the Bronx right. and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the connection between the Cambodian American community in the Bronx. Yeah. Maybe how that's impacted the Khmer community uh, of today. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I know a lot of folks don't know that we exist in the Bronx and folks always freak out because they're like, no, you're not from the Bronx. And if they don't see my face, they think I'm like a girl from the Bronx. Right. And so, um, so, you know, and I think that that identity, you know, um, really shaped Mekong as an organization, but myself and the work that we do around social justice work. And so, um, how do we get to the Bronx? We got here be, as part of uh, the largest refugee resettlement program in U.S. history. Um, so between 1975 um, and 1995, um, a lot of us from uh, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia uh, came to the United States making up the largest like refugee resettlement, right? And so we were primarily resettled throughout the country. Um, a lot of times folks were uh, sponsored by the churches or by uh, IRC, uh, the Refu committee, uh, Refugee Committee. Um, and so uh, my family and I were actually resettled in the Bronx in 1985. I remember it was September 1985. I landed in JFK, uh, seven years old, with my uh, track suit and super uh -huh. heavy hair. Um, and so we were pretty much resettled in a uh, uh, really poorly resourced community, right? And you folks remember like the Bronx was burning at that time and there was a huge war on, on drugs so we were you know in, in essence for me it was like living in two refugee camps before I lived in the Bronx and it looked and felt very similar because um, they were like war zones at those times right and so um, so and then the rise of just industrial the prison industrial complex really created conditions where our communities like really uh, uh, and our young folks, particularly our teenagers, um, were massively ma uh, put into um, incarceration because of the uh, war on crime, but also the gang war in New York City at that time. So we were basically inserted into urban poverty, um, and we have remained since. And I think a lot of folks don't know that there is a lot, the largest Southeast Asian population in New York City is in the Bronx. So that's how we got here, because the war in Southeast Asia and the refugee resettlement program. Yeah, and how, so fast forward to 2020, how do you think that's affected the community today or how, especially I think like the, the Cambodian and Vietnamese communities relationship, like with other communities in the Bronx? Well, I know that our bonds are forever, <laughs> like our lives are forever bonded in that way. And so that's why I like our work around um, black lives and our work around social justice and our work around um, commitment to um, liberation and and organizing um, through arts and culture um, is very core to Mekong's work. Um, and you know, for us, it's been um, when when we started Mekong, it was. I mean, we've been in the country. This year is the 45th anniversary mm -hmm. um, of the ending of the war in Southeast Asia, 
And so we've been in this country for pretty much 40, 45 years. And I think when seven, eight years ago, when we started Mekong, we did a community assessment and I was doing youth organizing at that time um, around welfare rights uh, and uh, also around deportation and also around uh, education, the educational system failing our parents and our communities. And so it was a realization that actually after 40 years of resettlement that our community has not changed and it has not grown. And it, it's probably one of the most invisible community in New York City um, mm -hmm. and within the API community. You know, our um, data shows that we are, the, has the highest rate of dropout, high school dropout rates in, 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 any, in the API community. So. For us, we started asking around and realized that actually the refugee resettlement program really failed our people. And so um, the young folks and I came together and said we needed to respond in a way and we needed to build the first and the only, like the, that's led by Southeast Asian folks, mm -hmm. um, an organization that would do that. So that's what we did seven, seven years ago. Yeah. And how did, I guess like, how did you decide to make it a national network? Because the Southeast Asian Freedom Network it's not just New York, the Bronx, it's all over the country. Yes. So, um, I mean, it was really lonely organizing in the Bronx, yeah. you know, uh -huh. being like the only Cambodian person. And I think that given that, um, you know, we were also like one of the newest API community in the United States that um, we, we were looking for people, you know, to like understand like our, our historical significance and how we've entered into the United States and talk about um, what it means for us to demand justice and all that stuff and so when we started the Southeast Asian Freedom Network it started actually as a calling uh, to organizers we just put out a call and was like hey are there any other Southeast Asian folks doing this because there weren't organizations there weren't Southeast Asian organizations and so um, when we uh, put the call out we put together a freedom school a training program in the Bronx and we saw, we found like 15 Southeast Asian organizers across the country. And so part of that was like our work. Um, we did a documentary called Eating Welfare. And that was an actual call out uh, to our community members because we were organizing around like the, the Welfare Reform Act in 19, of 1996, where it pushed people who were on public benefits to get jobs. And a lot of our community, you know, came to this country with no marketable skills. And so what we had was a high uh, rate of folks who were, um, you know, um, a, on some kind of public benefit, right? So when that cut happened, it mean it cut my food, it cut my mother's food, it cut the entire community's food. So for us, when we put that documented together and then went around the country um, to say, hey, you know, it was a calling. It was definitely a calling for Southeast Asian organi organizers who didn't have other organizers. And so you know, I'm, we're considered the OGs, yeah. <laughs> that, that means, and I'm, uh -huh. um, but it is, it is a responsibility that I think the folks that started the Southeast Asian Food Freedom Network and I really take seriously, that it is about building our pipeline and our leadership and our consciousness. Yeah, and, and so like, as you were kind of coming up and almost creating organizations, because maybe you weren't seeing as much of, the, much of it as you felt the community needed, who were your who were your mentors during this, or who were kind of like the the colleagues that were coming up at the same time that you yeah. like learned from? I mean, a lot of my my uh, so I was part of an organization called CAB Committee Against Anti Asian Violence, and so I had a lot of leaders that uh, from who were working against police brutality at that time, uh, who grew out and came out of the Vincent Chin movement. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, um, hate crime movement at that time too. So for us, you know, um, but honestly, Lauren, like yeah. my mother and my, mm -hmm. like those women in our community yeah. have always been the one, they've been organizing before we even thought what organizing was, making sure that families were taken care of and people, um, uh, that people, our people were taken care of. And I think that's actually core to like the Southeast Asian Freedom Network and which is also the core to Mekong is like, we build community, you know, and like we build relationships and love uh, and for our, you know, people often ask us like, what does justice mean for Southeast Asian? And for us, it's about healing, right? Like, and, and we know that our movement, you know, has been um, for what I learned from my community um, and my people and my uncles, you know, and my aunts and all of them is that 
our movement is at the intersection of healing and organizing and also to center blackness and um, to center anti-blackness in our work too. So I know we'll talk more about that too, but it's been, it, that's been sort of uh, the mentor. And actually, you know, a lot of the terms, a lot of the organizing work is, um, I give pop to all the black feminists that's laid those foundations for us, those thinking around intersectionality, reparation, things that, you know, that we are also using. Um, so we owe a lot to the black feminist movement uh, that has, has led us to build a stronger Southeast Asian movement in this country. Yeah, and maybe that might be a good segue into Mekong's week of action, which I think maybe wasn't wasn't planned before this. Can you can you tell me a little bit about that or like how that came about and what is it? We usually do a lot of week of actions, usually it's around detention deportation as a national network. And so um, so this week um, folks know uh, the killing of George Floyd in uh, Minneapolis um, uh, has really like shook our people. Uh, but this is not new. We know that. And we know what it means to not being black bodies, right? Um, and so uh, we have two organizations within the Southeast Asian Freedom Network, Man Forward, as well as Minnesota 8 out in Minnesota that does the on the ground work. And so it was when we saw that Hmong man who's Southeast Asian mm -hmm. stood by and saw the killing of George Floyd, we felt like it was really important for our community to galvanize around this. And so Mekong for a very long time have followed the leadership of the Moon for Black Lives. Um, and they have a policy platform that they have put in place. And so they called the Week of Action uh, this week. Um, and for us, the Week of Action includes the following. So uh, right after the, the, um, the video came out, uh, we called the Hmong community, actually had community conversations. And so with that, talking about anti-blackness, about how, what it means to be Hmong and stand up for black lives. Um, our folks had a lot, got a lot of uh, backlash, of course, right, from our own community threatening us. And, and so for us as Southeast Asians, we felt like we wanted to have those courageous conversations with our community. So on Friday, the Vietnamese folks is having their community conversation. Um, and and um, on sat Saturday, the Cambodian community is going to have their conversation. So. Um, for us, not a lot of our folks can take the street. You know, I mean, New York City, it's really challenging. COVID is still a panic. We are still in a pandemic. And so for us, it's like we are calling out our community and calling in our community to really stand up for Black lives. And so that is the week of action for us. And um, I mean, there's other things that are planned. Local organizations are doing sit-ins and engaging in different direct actions. Um, but for Mekong and the Southeast Asian Freedom Network, we put this together to begin to call our people into understanding what it means to stand for Black lives. Yeah. Yeah. And I know kind of also you mentioned a big thing of what Mekong does is fighting deportation, mm -hmm. uh, specifically of Southeast Asians. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and, you know, why sure. that was so critical? That, that's been um, uh, the Southeast Asian Freedom Network since our 20 years, and since we created 20 years ago. And you know, for folks like myself who came to this country as a refugee child, we folks didn't get this citizenship. I mean, it, we got a card that said permanent resident on it. And so a lot of our folks just thought that we were permanently here and um, we were citizens. Um, but as you all know, in the 1996 Immigration Reform Act, what that did was made, um, any conviction of fel uh, expanded aggravated felony that made everything deportable. And so a lot of our young people, you know, um, hung out and, and um, joined gangs because our parents worked two, three jobs, you know, in order to make ends meet. And so, um, and, our, and so our young folks started, get it, started getting um, uh, put in jail for one year, two years. Our young people, a lot of our young people at that time were getting charged as adults. And so, um, when we did our time, uh, the new law mandated, and it was retroactive, so that means people who were already released were up for deportation. So you have refugees who came when they were babies um, now being deported back to uh, Cambodia, Laos, uh, and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And for us, like, that is like the ultimate failure, failure in the refugee program, you know, and 
deportation of refugees was such a devastating marker of this failed refugee resettlement program. And so, um, and, this, and pretty much like the school to prison pipeline um, and all the pain that folks and the trauma that people carried to United, you know, to United States after the war uh, really impacted our community. And now we're seeing this all cycle of viciousness of separation. And so we want our people back home. In yeah. The United States. yeah. Is, is there something specifically that you think that people or the government, like this needs to change in order to kind of, you know, bring justice to this issue? We are working on all levels, community level, city, state. Uh, we are going to be launching a New York State Pardons Project with other communities of color who are also facing deportation uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, nationally, we're asking uh, working to look, put together a policy that amends um, and acknowledges Southeast Asian um, and the deportation to end deportation of Southeast Asian. And locally, it's about organizing our people, right? And like getting our elders and to come out to talk about that. There's still shame, you know, in our community around deportation. Um, and, you know, we've had some victories. Um, in 2016, we went to Cambodia to renegotiate the repatriation agreement. Uh, in 2019 alone, we brought in four people back home. So we will continue to do that um, and fight for them to come back. And so recently, there's been 800 Cambodians so far that's been deported, right? So for us, it's like finding those kinds of legal strategy to bring them back um, and also working uh, to create policy statewide um, um, and through governor pardons has been another way. And so employing all strategy um, to keep our family together. And I say stay connected with like the Southeast Asian Freedom Network and other organization that works particularly on Cambodian and Vietnamese and Laotian deportations around the country. And that includes like, I can share a list of just like, you know, West Coast, East Coast, <laughs> it's a bunch of us, but can get connected to those organizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Um, I think also, I just wanted to touch on the fact that, you know, your organization is located in the Bronx. The Bronx has been disproportionately affected by coronavirus in the past couple months. Um, I'm, ju I'm just curious what you're seeing in the community there. What, what kind of needs does the community have? Did coronavirus shift any of the priorities of your organization? Yeah, um, I mean, all of us pretty much had to pause a little bit and, and, and do a lot of rapid response work. So I'll say that because we were doing census organizing work, you know, we were doing civic engagement work. But, you know, Mekong also started as a, um, our work was around health justice and talking about how do we address the trauma and as part of a failed refugee settlement program response to our people. You know, we have, uh, for Cambodians, it's like 70% of our people have PTSD. Mm -hmm. and 50% and has depression. So for us, it's like, how do you build a community that is in such, you know, that, that the healing process haven't really started or anyone has actually come to commit to like supporting us in that way. And in the Bronx, we live in a county who has, that has the highest unemployment rate. rate. Mm -hmm. um, and we are, um, uh, the, has the highest unemployment rate, has high un uh, asthma rate. Um, and, and who has the lowest um, health outcome in all the counties in the United, in, in, in New York State. So for us, like this is not nothing new. And so we are um, uh, pissed at the response because you knew that the Bronx was the most unhealthy community. And still, um, like we have on one block, you know, like we see families um, have lost two or three family members. And so for us, we, in the Cambodian community, we've lost about six people and that's six families. And that for us as a small community, that's a lot. And I think one of the devastating things is like to also see people not have access to resource, you know, to, to, to still live in fear of just like, how am I gonna pay my rent? How am I gonna uh, feed my family? And so we uh, committed as Mekong to doing care packages every two weeks for our community members. And this morning we just did another one. And uh, it's, you know, lemongrass and everything Southeast Asian in it. Um, and also giving um, some community relief uh, to families and individuals who've lost their jobs. 
and um, who's also uh, uh, in need of just cash. Um, and it's, it's little, we give $500 to community members, but we know that um, and that can give them, you know, uh, can help with rent, you know, and things like that. So our response have been to make sure that our community feels safe and educated and that the community in the Bronx as a whole, like, that's why I like this pandemic is just part, it's just manifesting things that already have existed in the Bronx for many years, the disinvestment from our community. And so when the Bronx was burning, like I literally mean the Bronx is still burning. Like we have houses um, and, and city councils and city elected officials have not come to our community. It's only when they have primaries, right? So they come and say, hey, vote for me. And so, yeah, as Southeast Asian, we're calling BS on elected officials who have not invested in our community and like invested in funding NYPD and taking away like youth program this summer. Like we're, we're fighting it on all fronts. Yeah. How, with there's, there's so many different areas that Mekong is engaged in and in so many levels. How, how, how do you make it all happen? Like who is, who is your team? Who's your support network? Yeah. That makes this happen. I mean, of course, our national partners, but also like um, we get a lot, we are base building organization, which means we are membership led as well. And mm -hmm. so we only hire staff who are Southeast Asian and from the community. Our commitment to hiring from our community is really important. And so we have an amazing staff um, of seven of us that's making mm -hmm. all of this happen. Uh, very little, but we are expanding pretty soon. Um, and so it, is, it has been the Southeast Asian, the Cambodians and Vietnamese staff at the front line of all of this. And I think that, you know, um, we understand that we, we're, we're always called to be warriors and survivors at the same time, you know, as leaders in the community. So, um, and so for us, like even my staff, like we take mental health days, I mean, you yeah. know, things like that. And just like, you know, that um, as community of color, like these, these are the experiences and, and, and and, and, and also, you know, prioritizing the leadership of women and queer folks in our community because they're the most marginalized. So that's the majority of Mekong staffing. Um, and so, and I know that, that every day, I think my staff and I like understand that we know what it means like to be forced, right? To be, to be forced to find peace with our own trauma and to find justice in our own experiences and, you know, to be stripped and to basically like um, find solidarity from the outside world when the war was happening in Southeast Asia. And we know that it means um, that, um, you know, as black community charged genocide, uh, war on, and state violence um, on their lives by the, you know, by police um, and by system that we actually um, know what it means to stand in solidarity and we will continue to show up. And that's, that's the thinking and the core that we actually, that the staff understands and know that we are committed to not just only being anti-Black, but we're committed to being pro-Black. So that means as long as I am not in a Black body, I cannot tell any Black person how they should protest, how they should mourn, how they should grieve. Um, and it is up to them to do that. And so um, that's been our centering in the last couple of months. Um, a weeks actually, you know, around this. And we've been doing this for a very long time. You know, we looked at our statement in 2014 and we just like, it's the same thing. Like we are, we, black bodies um, are being killed, right? And so for us, um, it means that we're gonna have to have some very hard conversation. And um, that's been um, like the staff conversation. And yeah, you know, it's really my staff that really, um, and our community members who, engage in these conversations every day yeah and does it feel like a generational conversation i mean is it is it about the younger generation maybe reaching out to the to an older generation mm. I, it's a it's actually you know it's really funny because the elders are just like we understand they mm -hmm. may not understand the looting right? Because then we're like, well, actually, are you valuing property over lives? Like, you know, so like there's, there's way to change it. I mean, if we're talking about looting, we're talking about 
looting from our, our education system. Let's talk about the looting from, you know, our food pantry, like programs for young people. Like, we, we can have a conversation around looting. Um, but I think the adults, um, what we've engaged in is like, actually they understand why it is, um, it is a cry for us, right, too, because um, it's actually the other generation, which is like my generation and um, uh, the younger generation, actually, some folks who actually have bought into whiteness, right, mm -hmm. who actually um, have anti-blackness in them, but are not committed to undoing it. Um, so we're not saying that you don't, um, uh, what we're saying is that every one of us have anti-blackness because we live in a system that has created these things. And, and actually the conversation in our community is about colorism. And that's where we've had to start. You know, why is it that we value light-skinned people over dark-skinned people in the Cambodian community, you know? And that, um, and so, so when you buy into whiteness and when you buy into that, you actually, um, those are the actually people that we've had the hardest conversation with because they're like, I did it. You know, it becomes an individual um, conversation. And, um, but, you know, there are people who, uh, in our community that, that be truly believes in that um, our liberation is tied to the liberation of black people. And so um, as we pull our, communication, our community into those conversations, uh, we're also calling out um, people messed up behavior too. Yeah. Are there, are there any other steps that those, that you're seeing for those like in the Asian American community or even outside of that, that you feel like have been effective that you're like, I would love to see more of that. I mean, when, when, you know, when the anti-Asian racism thing happened, you know, we were like, okay, stop showing the videos, you know, like mm -hmm. really commit ourselves to being anti-black because what we, what we, what we, what we have to understand is that like black folks have been living in this country 400 years on the occupied state of like just policing and violence on their body, you know, being in a, and like, um, we've asked people to stop sharing the videos. Mm -hmm. We've asked folks to acknowledge that black community is disproportionately impacted, right? Um, and start diverting our resources into addressing that, their needs. And honestly, like just stop being angry at individuals and being angry at systems and racist leaders, right? Um, yeah. And like, we know that a part of it is like us having to envision um, a solution like that addresses uh, violence to not use the criminal justice system as a solution for conflict within our communities, you know? And honestly, like for, for me, it's like the calling in is like, well, let's learn and unpack and undo anti-blackness, right? And deepen our analysis of oppression. Um, and that, you know, obviously as Asian, like we all are fighting against the model minority myth. You know, and it's the scapegoat, it's the wedge, and and really stop using ourselves as pawn in a uh, in a white supremacist system, right? And that um, and have these conversations. Like it's the hardest. Like it's been so hard to have these conversations because it is the changing the hearts and minds of our people so that they can act, right? So they can stand in solidarity, and that's the work that we're committed to as Southeast Asian organizers within Mekong and within the Southeast Asian Freedom Network and really to stand in solidarity and fight back with the black community while they're mourning and while they're fighting for their lives. Um, and so, you know, and we know that like every 28 hours, um, a black person is shot, you know, um, uh, by the police and we were, and for us, like I always say that um, we will always respect and follow the leadership of the most marginalized communities on the ground. It's the black young people, it's the black queer folks, it's the black trans folks, it's the black mothers and the black sisters. And, you know, we are really guided by those who have been in the streets in the last couple of days and hundreds, hundreds of streets of hours before this. Um, so we got to do our part. Like we need to just roll up our sleeves. We got to hit the streets and do our part to make the world sort of stop and see the injustice that's happening in this country for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm. Yeah. Uh, let's see, I think, I think we have time for, uh, there's a, there's a, we got one question, which is 
uh, I think moves the conversation a little different direction. Sure. Sina Sam asked, how can the Khmer community use stories, kind of like the Cambodian rock band, and stories about genocide history to connect to brown, uh, black and other brown communities in the US? Yeah. I mean, it's, it is about sharing like how we entered a relationship with the United States and oppressions and things like that. And I, I know that um, the healing process is just starting off with our people, you know, having those conversations, even between different generations. And, the he and, and I also know that healing is a lifelong process. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, uh, and I said this before, which is like, you know, we know, we know, like ground ourselves in our own history of like, we know what it's like to lose family, um, to witness death, to witness genocide. And I think for us is like, um, but also ground ourselves in the history of this country, right? Of how it is that black folks have been oppressed so many years in this country and in this system. And so um, storytelling is one of the things we do uh, through arts and culture. You know, one of the things that we, we have a garden here in the Bronx, mm -hmm. some people can call it a farm, some people can call it a garden. Yeah. Um, and so we have a space where, you know, for us engaging in um, um, sharing of food and um, planting of different food is also a way for us to engage our community. And that when, you know, Ms. Green who lives upstairs, our care package is for Southeast Asian, but we're also sending a care package for the black community in the buildings, you know? So um, it's those kind of act and then sharing with them like, yeah, this is how we got here. You know, yeah. this is, and, and actually if it wasn't for the black leadership, we wouldn't have been here. So um, like for real, for real, it is that, right? Um, and so for us, it's like uh, continuing to have like heart to heart conversation with our community members and our adults. Um, and yeah, more like Southeast Asian writers and thinkers, mm -hmm. you know, and like for Cambodian, 90% um, of our intellect, our artists, our, 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 uh, our writers were all killed during the genocide. So what you have left was just peasants and farmers. So it is our duty, yeah, as Southeast Asian folks to cultivate the arts. And, and I think that storytelling is part of that. Yeah. Um, I think in the time we have left, any, anything I missed that you just, you want to talk about or any, any shout outs to people that you think are doing great work right now? Um, the moon, definitely the moon for Black Lives, the week of action. I do want to say uh, what their demands are so that we all understand. Uh, there are very clear demands in terms of uh, this week, we demand the rights to um, a pro protester to be respected. We demand a disvestment from police and investment in Black communities. We demand immediate relief for our communities. We demand community control. Uh, we demand an end to the war against Black people. And so as Southeast Asian people, uh, we stand and echo those things. And I, I would just also like to say that, you know, every day, sort of our work around anti-blackness is actually waking up and betraying it every day and committing to addressing my own anti-blackness, anti right? And be pro-black. And that means that I don't get to judge, I don't get to decide how black folks mourn and fight. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm so grateful for you taking out the time from your busy schedule to like have this conversation with us. No, oh, thank you. Um, and I thank everyone else who happens to be listening um, for, for tuning in and I hope you can, you can take what you learn from this conversation and apply it to your own lives. And I think that there might be some resources or links uh, both on Mekong's website, which is mekongnyc.org and Signature's website. So I, I encourage everyone just to, uh, to check those out. And uh, everyone take care. So thank you, Chaya. Thank you so much for having me. And, um, support Black Lives. Yeah. Support Black organizations and women and queer folks. <laughs>